You know what everyone needs right now? Another video about the pandemic. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit the planet, one of the first things everyone noticed was that people stopped moving. Nearly 5 million Canadians started working from home on top of the 2.8 million who were furloughed or laid off. Schools were closed, stores were closed, Denny's was closed. And the result? Empty roads, empty trains, empty buses, and a whole lot of uncertainty around what happens next. So let's start this story with something really exciting. Yeah, a graph. This graph shows the amount of people asking for driving directions through Apple Maps in Canada and how that's changed since January of this year. You see it drop rapidly in March as COVID cases first spiked in the country. Then as the year went on, it gradually came back up before dropping back down again because we can't get our act together. But now compare that with public transit. In March, transit ridership across Canada dropped a whopping 83%, and the recovery since then has been much weaker. That makes sense. It can be really difficult to social distance on public transit, and frankly, it's way easier to keep your distance when you're surrounded by a steel box with windows. But all that has raised some concerns. We might be seeing a lot more traffic in the future. People that used transit before could switch to driving, adding more cars to the roads. And to top it off, more people appear to be moving from downtown areas into car-oriented suburbs. All that is a recipe for way more congestion. Many cities are already reporting traffic levels returning to normal, and in London, congestion levels are actually higher than they were last year. Now, there's another key factor to consider here. Remote work. A lot of people are working from home right now, so the amount of traffic that returns to our roads also really depends on the amount of people that return to physical offices after this pandemic. But I'm going to avoid opening up that whole can of worms because regardless of what happens to offices, there's still another issue here. Public transit is in trouble. With low ridership, virtually every public transit provider in Canada is struggling to stay afloat. Most have needed government support through grants such as the Safe Restart Agreement, except for New Brunswick because they said no thank you to free money. Okay. Anyways, if there isn't a full recovery before these grants run out, these transit systems will almost certainly be facing cuts. Cities in the United States have already made cuts to their public transit, and in Ontario, there are concerns that the provincial government will privatize and cut public transit services as the pandemic progresses. But there is one transportation method I haven't brought up yet. Arms and legs. Or what normal people call active transportation bikes, walking, scooters, and other physical methods. The pandemic has made these options very popular. In Vancouver, bike counters observed a huge increase in cyclists this spring compared to the previous year, and Toronto has reported similar increases as well. These methods are relatively cheap, they don't clog up precious road space, and they allow for social distancing, all while not contributing to the heat death of the planet. With that, many see active transportation as a way forward during this pandemic. From what we found, 19 of the largest 25 cities across Canada have implemented major active transportation projects this year. Toronto is fast-tracking 40 kilometers of new bike lanes, Montreal added 327 kilometers of bicycle and pedestrian paths, and Vancouver shut down Stanley Park to car traffic, creating a new route for cyclists. Many cities have also taken advantage of empty streets and converted that space for patios and small parks which have led to some interesting scenarios, like this patio with a tree inside it, or this patio with a bus stop inside it, or this patio next to a demolition site. These are promising changes that could help more people feel comfortable using active transportation. But can bikes and scooters fully replace cars in transit? Well, that's where I get a bit more skeptical. Take a look at this map showing commuting flow in Metro Vancouver. Looks pretty cool, but the key thing to notice is that most people commute into downtown Vancouver from outer suburbs like Burnaby, Surrey, and the North Shore. These are long distances. It would take two hours to cycle from Surrey Central to Vancouver, or 5.5 hours by walking. It just makes way more sense to drive or take transit. As a stubborn cyclist myself, this is a tough pill to swallow, but the reality is that active transportation projects can only go so far to address the full scope of transportation issues during this pandemic. And that makes me concerned about who we might be overlooking. These commuting patterns exist for good reason. 
Vancouver has some of the highest real estate prices in the world, and many people who work in the city just can't afford to live in the city. An average two-bedroom apartment in Vancouver costs $2,500 a month. In Surrey, that same apartment would cost just $1,200 a month. You can see that dynamic really reflected in the median incomes across Metro Vancouver. Those with higher incomes can afford to live close to bikeable and walkable downtown areas. Those with lower incomes tend to live in the outskirts. That's a common pattern in many cities today. In 2019, The Economist reported that the poor are increasingly clustered together outside newly thriving central cities, and thus out of sight. But in Metro Vancouver, many of those lower income neighborhoods have a key advantage. Take a look at that map again. Many of those lower income neighborhoods in Metro Vancouver are connected to a network of SkyTrain routes, our version of subways. And that is a big deal. A national study in the US found that commuting time was the single strongest factor in the odds of escaping poverty, more than crime rates and elementary school test scores. Fast and reliable transportation connects people to more opportunities and ultimately helps them move up in society. But I don't need a study to tell me that. When I first moved to Vancouver, I could only afford to live with my parents in Langley, a suburb four cities away from the downtown. Uh, I was unemployed, broke, and admittedly a bit lost. But what I did have available to me was a recently opened bus route called the 555. It could take me directly to a SkyTrain station, which took me straight to downtown Vancouver. That commute helped me land my first part-time job downtown, a foot in the door that ultimately led to the opportunities I have today. That's why I'm especially concerned about this issue. Changes in our transportation network don't just affect our mobility, they affect our social mobility. More congestion on the roads or a weaker public transit system will put up way more barriers for people who are trying to improve their lives. So with that in mind, here are some other ideas. Many cities have used this pandemic to actually invest more in their public transit networks. Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and Boston have introduced new bus lanes to ensure that transit gets priority on the streets as traffic returns. In Missoula, Austin, and the Bay Area, citizens have actually voted for new taxes to directly fund transit. Yeah, more taxes. And one of my favorite ideas comes from my hometown of Vancouver, where the transit authority might get into the housing development business to create more revenue. Then there are more controversial ideas. In Vancouver, the city is also considering a congestion charge, basically tolls for cars driving into the downtown core. And, you know, I don't really have the answers for what will or won't work. These issues are complex, and I'm just a guy that makes videos for the internet. But working on this story has helped me recognize one thing. For many people, having access to a good form of transportation is a lifeline. And I think prioritizing that will help a lot of people move on from here.